Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 28, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Now, uh, every Friday the show comes out, available from our website, theretrohour.com, SoundCloud, Stitcher and iTunes as well. Um, yeah. We just realised, actually, we haven't had many iTunes uh, comments recently. No, no, yeah, we're, we're kind of stuck at 22, so please, <laughs> any reviews you can will be appreciated. Yeah, they're always really useful. And uh, any feedback you've got, of course, we're on, uh, we're on SoundCloud. The comments on there are always interesting too. Now, uh, if you're regularly listening, you'll know the way the show works. Ravi and I chat about the uh, big retro stories of the week first and then second half of the show. Uh, we hand over to someone who's got a really interesting history in the world of video games. This week, I think, this is probably the first... Um, guy who's worked in graphics that we've had on the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, we've had a lot of musicians, but now we're kind of getting some artists. And this guy's amazing, John Kershaw. He he basically did a lot of the stuff that I thought should have been an Amiga, mm-hmm. like Z Steel Soldiers, Syndicate Wars, all the like later games that were early PlayStation ones. So this guy's all about 2D to 3D, you know, FMVs, all this kind of early 3D development. Well, he started on the Amiga in 88 as well, he was saying, didn't he? And I mean, he worked for some, uh, you know, massive studios and companies, Bitmaps, he worked with uh, Bullfrog, yeah. uh, Graph Gold, he worked on games like Fire and Ice on the Amiga, Virocop as well. Well, first time we've talked about Peter Molyneux, we've talked about Bullfrog, and we've talked about Calf Gold, so this is a great <laughs> episode. <laughs> yeah, so uh, anyone that kind of, you know, love gaming in the uh, late 80s to late 90s, this is one for you, you're going to love this week's episode. John Kershaw on the Retro Hour in about half an hour from now. Now, now, uh, there is a special event coming up at the end of this month. Yes, it's the Mature Podcast Gamers Expo. Are we you... mature? Yeah, well, <laughs> immature. But um, you're probably wondering why we're advertising this, but um, we're going to be there. Well, well I'm going to be there. Yeah, <laughs> so come down if you're in uh, Nottingham. It's at the Merkel Hotel. Mm-hmm. And, oh, let me just check the date. I think it's on the 30th, isn't it? Of yeah, July, uh, yeah. End of the month. Because um, it's actually the weekend I'm at my friend's wedding. Um, I'd love to come down to this show because it's only, well, the show comes out on Friday, so it's two weeks. Um, If you can make it along to Nottingham, uh, Ravi's actually been invited along to uh, be on the panel. I think they're doing some kind of um, recording a podcast down there. Yeah, they're going to be doing a live one. But if you come down, you can also get tickets, discount tickets for the National Video Game Arcade, which is a massive area. They've got like HTC Vive you can put on custom games in there. Mm-hmm. Fruit Ninja is great. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we've got the uh, the Video Games Lounge. It's just over the road too. Yeah, yeah. So you can pop in and play games. It's like a whole video game corner. So if you just want to come down for the afternoon or evening and just... Uh have a drink and a play. I'll be there. Yeah, drinks are all on Ravi. Is that right? No. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to make it along, it's coming up on uh, July 30th and uh, all the details will be in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get into this week's news, um, I went to see it last night. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is the Ghostbusters movie. What did you think, Dan? Now, let me give you a bit of background here because I've never really talked about this on the show before. If you went back to like the late 80s and early 90s, you'd probably struggle to find a bigger Ghostbusters fan than me. Okay. Well, I was a big fan of number two. I was number two on my birthday. Oh, wow. Um, okay. so. The day it came out, I was that excited. So I think, I, mean, I remember the show, the original Ghostbusters movie, it was at Christmas one year, um, probably Christmas 87, I think it was on. I remember like my mum, like, with all the family coming over and shed it on the TV and I was just there watching it. And like, you know, I was only a little kid at the time, but I was like, you know, got a bit scared of it and had a nightmare yeah. that like Slimer was going to get me or something <laughs> that night. But then they started showing the cartoon over here, like the real Ghostbusters. And like me and my mates got obsessed with that and we ended up getting all like the Kenner toys and I'd buy the comics oh, so every did week. Did you have like a proton pack? and Everything. <laughs> Everything. I'm not even joking. I probably had about 300 Ghostbusters toys. Oh, wow. And then when we moved house when I was about 12, my mum threw every one of them in the bin. What? That's a fortune gone. Yeah. They got for like 50 quid each at eBay oh, now. God. Like, seriously. <laughs> um, but I had it all at like, the firehouse, at the traps, yeah. at the packs, at the, you know, that projector guns and all that. And then yeah, it was on my birthday. My dad actually um, said to my teacher that, because uh, it came out in December, um, that I had like a dentist appointment and then we were like went to the first cinema showing at like 11 in the morning to watch it. Yeah. So that was the last Ghostbusters movie I saw at the cinema. So the last one you saw was in 1989. It's 2016 <laughs> and you're seeing a new one. What's it like? So. In um, your opinion. Well, that's the background and obviously I'd seen the trailer online and like, um, you know, I was the same as anyone. The trailer did look pretty bad. I think it is like, it's the most downvoted video in YouTube history. Yeah, it's the most disliked trailer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my hopes weren't high going into this, but I thought it's a new Ghostbusters film. I kind of want to see it straight away. So went along this week. And I've got to say, it's probably not as bad as I expected. So it's still bad. <laughs> but it is still bad. Film. bad. Okay. But I think, <laughs> I think you go into the cinema with very low expectations 
you, you hopes aren't quite as shattered if it if it is actually awful then. But I wouldn't say it, I'd probably give it if I had to give it a rating, maybe six out of ten. Okay, so you weren't screaming at the sh- screen going, you've ruined Ghostbusters, no, how dare they, every scene? Well, to me, I mean, I, I mentioned this in our Facebook page as well, I've kind of put some comments on here, but, you know, because I put a picture of my tickets up and yeah. what to see at the yeah. IMAX and all that. Um, the humour is nowhere near kind of, you know, the original Ghostbusters movie was quite sarcastic and had a bit of, like, dry humour and that. It was quite dirty as well, and it was quite adult. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stuff you miss over when you're a kid, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, when I rewatched it the other day, I was like, Bill Murray... That scene with Dan Aykroyd and the ghost flying over yeah, him yeah. and uh, unzips his pants and remembers that bit. Uh, but this one, I mean, pretty much the humour is fart gags. And, yeah. you know, it's... Yeah. I said it, you know, at one point, it kind of reminded me a bit of, like, a, a scary movie-style parody of a Ghostbusters film. Yeah. I, I, I think it's... Uh, they're obviously going to have to remake another one that's going to be a lot better because, like... With Star Trek, they've managed to continue making good movies. With Star Wars, they have. Well, Ghostbusters, they've just taken this plunge. Well, this has been such a long time. In the, I remember rumours about Ghostbusters 3 coming out in like 1992, 93. Yeah, and obviously, yeah. there's all those scripts that Dan Aykroyd wrote. And, you know, some of them have been leaked online. And, you know, it's it's been like 25 years coming, a yeah. new Ghostbusters movie. And I think anything that's kind of been hyped and anticipated for that long is going to disappoint people. It's never going to be as good as people expect. And yeah, it could have been a hell of a lot better than it actually is. But I'd say, I mean, I kind of made a comparison. I like Terminator movies as well. Mm. And I went to see Terminator Genesis. Yeah. And that, again, it's a film you get the cinema. It's all right. You're not going to buy it on Blu-ray. You probably would never watch it again. But if you're into that franchise, it's probably watchable. Yeah, you're watching it for the I'll be back. <laughs> That's and I guess you're watching Ghostbusters for the siren. Yeah, you know, and I mean, that kind of nostalgia. It actually starts quite good, the Ghostbusters movie, the new one. I mean, it, the setup of it at the beginning of that, it actually starts really good. And they've got the original Ghostbusters theme comes in. Yeah, it's yeah. not that awful Fallout Boy version. And okay. It's kind of storyline is very similar to the original. Like, you know, they're at university, they get kicked out. Well, spoilers, spoilers. Well, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, it, it's, it's all, you know, very predictable. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think there is actually some good bits. I mean, there's one bit where, and this is a little bit of a spoiler here. Um, a ghost actually comes in to like a packed uh, music concert mm. and then they get the proton packs out and they're shooting it and all that. And that, I got a got kind of goosebumps thinking, oh yeah, you know, even the proton stream looked the same yeah, as yeah. it did in the original movie. So that was kind of cool, you know, some okay, of those scenes. So yeah, good. there's bits, there's bits of nostalgia. Anyway, should we get on to gaming? Because, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. I think uh, it was about five minutes on Ghostbusters. But, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, we are the retro hour. Ghostbusters, yeah, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people love it. Thing. And, so, um, and by the sounds of it, you were a Ghostbuster as a youth. So I had the proton pack, I was, I was all signed up. Yeah. <laughs> right then, well, this first story this week is uh, something else has been a long time coming. Oh, well, a very long time, because I remember this whole time I've been trying to get you to chip my Saturn. It hasn't been working. It I've hasn't got. been working, but there's no need now. Thanks to uh, a listener has submitted the news, Joseph Wieger. Wieger, maybe? He's from Hungary. He's from Hungary, and uh, he's submitted this news that the Sega Saturn DRM has finally been cracked. <laughs> Now, it has been, what, when did the Saturn come out? Like 21, 20 22 years, years ago? ago? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, but I mean, obviously the Dreamcast had cracked that straight away, didn't they? You could download ISOs and... No, I um, remember the day that the Dreamcast came out, there was a disc going around called the Exodus disc and, no, Utopia disc, that yeah, was it. Yeah, Utopia, that was Yeah, mm-hmm. and you could just boot straight away. But um, they did a good job, obviously, on the uh, the Saturn um, copy protection. It's like you said, yeah, 22 years down the line, you still do um, need like a mod chip if you want to do CDs. But now, uh, this guy's posted a YouTube video, and um, he's basically done it. His name's uh, James Lardois, um, known as the internet as Dr. Abrasive. He's reverse-engineered um, the hardware-based DRM on the Saturn's physical media, and now he's developed this um, USB-based loader that plugs into the video, ca- uh, the video CD card slot on the back, the expansion port, and then lets you load games from a USB. That's so cool. Because they had one of these for the Dreamcast, and it was through the back, through the serial, so it's serial to SD, Mm -hmm. and a lot of the music wouldn't run fast enough. So I'm hoping that this video pass-through CD slot works a lot faster, and then it will mean you could get full retail ISOs onto the uh, USB. Well, they're looking at it here. I mean, it's, uh, it said it goes into the video CD card slot and that, um, you know, had direct memory access, I think. Okay, you know, so like that, that, that should be fast as... Well, it runs yeah. you new full motion video. You can stream all that oh, from nice. it. So it'll be, uh, by the looks of it, it'll be as good as running a CD. Oh, there so. could be a lot of homebrew Saturn titles starting <laughs> to come out now. <laughs> but the Saturn, I mean, it's kind of a... I think it's a very underrated platform. It got obviously tranced by the PlayStation, didn't it, when it came out, but... It's the best of 2D, isn't it? It's like it's pinnacle, to the, yeah. high, the pinnacle, the height of 2D. 
but it's 2D. <laughs> yeah, the PlayStation it was, smashed it. It was an arcade machine in your home, really. You know, what I mean, obviously, yeah. it was it was a you know nightmare to program for. Um, you know, its architecture was a bit bit of a nightmare for developers. But the ones who did use it properly, I mean, it was yeah, brilliant 2D system. And now, I mean, the fact that I, I've got you know a mod chip in mine, and I've been trying to do yours with yeah. my old chip that didn't work properly. You know, just being able to play all, especially all like the uh, shoot 'em up games and stuff that only came out in Japan and we didn't get over yeah. here. Yeah. There's um, that's some really cool stuff. We'll pop a link in the show notes. Um, it's not out just yet, but apparently he's going to release it as a commercial product that you can buy. Hopefully it won't be too expensive. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, expect some uh, new Saturn stuff this year after yeah. that, no doubt. Now, uh, we mentioned Sega there, and we've got some good news about Nintendo. Yes, we were on about it last week, and we were saying how they need to innovate to survive, and it looks <laughs> like they have, because no one is shutting up about Pokemon Go. Have you played it yet, Dan? You know what? I haven't. Um, I looked at it, because you, you got it like... Um, day one didn't you or something I remember you telling I me I got about it, it at three in the morning yeah. and then ran out of my house in the rain and was catching Pokemons in alleyways <laughs> in the middle of the dark yeah. well for people that haven't um, actually played I mean and it's been all over the media and that but explain how this works it's a mobile game isn't it it's a mobile game that's actually not that innovative what they've done is they've used lots of different mobile games that have been there before and they've combined them so the first thing that they have in there is they have Google Maps now Google Maps, they've picked out all the little landmarks. So they've put it as a layer over your world and all the different landmarks suddenly become Pokemon gyms or stops and you can kind of train there and fight over them. So that's really cool. In your local area? In your local area, yeah. So, you know, throughout the country, there'll be different ones or throughout the world. Now, they've also done an accelerometer in there. So it measures the distances you have to walk. So you have to walk to certain distances um, to earn Pokemon. So they're using all these different kind of aspects of phone games that were previously there to create this whole layered world. They've even got augmented reality. So, uh, you know, you can see the ground with your camera and then there's a Pokemon <laughs> running along and you can, like, throw your ball on it. And everyone gets the same experience, like, you know, cause I know people kind of go to areas and they all kind of see the same thing. Yeah, well... They're, they're, they're kind of chasing the same Pokemons mm-hmm. and you can also go and fight other players. And, for example, my girlfriend's currently doing it and she'd won a gym in one area. So she put on Facebook, I've won this gym and people were travelling across the city from her, <laughs> on her team to come and meet her and then back her up at the gym. <laughs> so You essentially turn the world into a massive multiplayer game. Yeah. Now, the most interesting thing about this, this isn't actually made by Nintendo. It's made by a third-party company that is part of the Pokemon company that Nintendo own. But their shares have gone up 52%. 52%, mate. It's in like a week. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But that shows to me how unconfident people were in Nintendo, you know, that their shares were that low. And now suddenly this one Pokemon title that's taken the world by storm, one mobile phone game, and they're up 52%. It's crazy. But, I mean, a real turnaround. It absolutely is. And, it, you know, we've said this on the show before. I mean, obviously, their last big hit was the Wii. And, again, it's that casual game in market, isn't it? And it's totally the right thing for them to do, to go mobile. Because, you know, everyone's got one. And that audience, I think, that are into these franchises and love Nintendo, I think they're probably more likely to play games on, like, stuff like, um, you know, the mobile phone or a tablet than go out and buy, like, a, a Wii U or something yeah. like that. And uh, it's, it's kind of interesting as well, because they're saying a lot of the people are playing it, uh, you know, old original Pokemon fans when they played it on their Game Boy and stuff so they're all like my age oh yeah all, <laughs> you know? all my friends on Facebook are doing it yeah they're all like yeah. guys in the t- late 20s and like late, late 30s yeah running you know, through it? the city trying to look for <laughs> three these three in the morning uh, yeah <laughs> I mean there have been some dark sides to it as well I heard about um, some guy called like, <laughs> caused like a massive traffic pile up um, yeah there's somebody found a dead body and stuff yeah. but there's, there's little Pokemon dancing on it I guess this is going to happen with anything that uh kind of creates a new world, a new layer over the other world. But uh, Pokemon seems to be the way to do it at the moment, and they seem to have got it right. Well, you're sending people out into the big bad world, you know what I mean? It's like uh, leaving your bedroom, mate, pretty scary. Yeah, yeah, that, well, that's the thing. <laughs> I can imagine there's a lot of unhealthy Pokemon players that are really annoyed that they have to walk to get a Pokemon. <laughs> get some exercise, yeah. damn this. But, uh, yeah, you know, like we said, I mean, we've talked about Nintendo um, a fair bit on the show the last couple of weeks. It hasn't all been compliment. We haven't been complimenting them too much recently. Uh, but, you know, credit where credit's due, I think they've done really well. The, well the question is, how long term is this going to last? Mm-hmm. And is it enough money and investment from maybe future go games that they're going to bring out or Mm. other kind of world stuff is that enough to save them from the console sales disaster 
Yeah, and I think obviously the NX is the next thing for them. But I think yeah. it's just, um, obviously you can see from the, the, the amount that the, the share price has gone up, I think people have got a bit more confidence in them again, which I think they really needed. Oh, definitely, yeah. This is a, a saving grace, definitely. Mm-hmm. Now, another Nintendo story while we're on the topic. Uh, we did mention, obviously, and a, a really quick summary because we've talked about this before and it's been covered to death, but the original PlayStation was going to be basically a CD-ROM drive for the Super Nintendo. Yeah, Nintendo PlayStation. That's what it was going to be called. That, that you know, partnership fell apart in the early 90s. A prototype of a Nintendo PlayStation was actually found um, about a year and a half ago um, by a guy who found one in his attic. Now, there's been a game made for this Nintendo PlayStation prototype. I'm and it's just homebrew. watching it now. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. Now, this is called uh, Super Boss Gaiden. And uh, the way it works is you play a Sony exec who gets sent into a violent rage after learning that unlicensed software has been created for the scrapped SNES CD-ROM add-on. <laughs> so then you've got to go through and track down everyone who's responsible for this. <laughs> now, this actually looks hilarious. And, you know, it, it is, um, it's a fan-made game. The graphics, you know, look typical like Super Nintendo. It's actually pretty well done, I think. Yeah. It's actually available for download. There is an emulator now because they've dumped the ROM of oh, this um, wow. PlayStation you know, cool. CD-ROM drive. So you can uh, boot it up in, in the emulator, which is called... Um, no SSNS with a dollar sign in the middle. <laughs> so uh, I'll pop a link in the show notes if you want to find that. And you can burn it to a CDR, um, you know, you can play it on an emulator, or you can even dump it onto an EverDrive, because essentially it's just a game on a CD-ROM. And you can actually play it on an original Super Nintendo too. But it will boot on the emulator as well, and the original hardware they've tried it on, so... Nice. You know, we did mention on the show before that we think it wasn't really going to add that much to the Super Nintendo's abilities, just more storage space, which it yeah. seems like that's all it is, really. Yeah, because I don't think this new game's using tons of new features or anything. Oh, no. It's just a SNES game. Isn't it? It's about 800k or something, I think. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> hilarious game, though. And yeah, yeah, it's pretty... yeah, yeah. It's a wicked concept. I like it. Now, the Amiga CD32 is a platform that often gets a lot of love and, uh, you know, homebrews and stuff made for it. And there is yet another one. Oh, yeah. And this is a cool one, seeing as we had Chris Holsbeck on the show last week, this is the Great Guiana Sisters, but special edition. So, what's new with the special edition? The special edition is enhanced, it's unofficial, but it has a new soundtrack, and it has improved graphics, and a lovely little FMV intro. Oh, nice. Yeah. (laughs) So, this is all going on the CD32, thanks to our guys at uh, Indie Retro News and is it Iraq? Iraq, yeah, he's a guy. Yeah. He's on EAB, isn't he, as well? Um, I think he's one of the main guys who puts together these compilations. But he does such a good job of them. Yeah, and uh, this looks really cool. I always like Guiana, and uh, it's nice to have the new one as well. It does look exactly like Super Mario World. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the pipes, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, even, even like these graphics remind me of like you know the the, uh, the one on the Super Nintendo. It looks, looks very similar to that. We, we did obviously chat to Chris Hill's bet last week, and it's a game that obviously, it's kind of got a bit of a... A myth around it because it got took off sale and all that but yeah. it's nice to see, see it getting some love and getting some attention i think after all this time yeah definitely and uh, you know we're going to keep informing you about these cd32 releases because they're really cool and <laughs> we love the cd32 so we like a bit of a life being leased into an old console and a lot of them get made as well it's, it seems like they're churning one out like what maybe like one or two a month at the moment yeah i'm just it? looking at the moment there's that football fever one banshee that we mentioned mm-hmm. and walker you know they're great absolutely now We obviously covered these um, ZX Spectrum remakes. Yeah, there's been loads of them recently, (laughs) hasn't there? That was about three or four now, the last couple of years have come out. It's hard trying to keep track of um, how many of these different projects are going on. Uh, But there has been quite a bad update, actually, on a Eurogamer. Um, They've been trying to chase down the one that was the Elite Systems one. Ah, yeah. Yeah, that was the one that was on, oh, Charlie Brooker's Screen Wipe. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. It was the Kickstarter. Actually, it was like 2013. (laughs) This Kickstarter was on. I believe it's been nearly three years. Um, But it turns out that some of the people who backed the original project have still not got their hardware. Like, you know. What, since 2013? Yeah. Wow. Well, I think the actual product was made probably a year later. Um, They started to ship some of them out in 2014. Um, But there have been people that are still, you know, like 18 months to two years later, trying to get hold of systems that they paid for. They've put quite a bit of money down on these as well, haven't they? Yeah, and I mean, you know, I think it started from, um, I think something like 80 quid was the the lowest one. Some people here, though, put down like £150 to get like special Minor minor theme versions of it. And, uh, you know, there's some like kind of higher ones as well that people just haven't got and they're trying to chase up you know the, the guys who are behind this has there been any response from them or anything? well so far i mean eurogamer have uh, been trying to 
track down the team behind this. Um, obviously, it was Elite Systems. They're still there selling it on Amazon, stuff like that. You know, they've still yeah. got it listed. So they've been trying to get hold of them. Steve Wilcox, the guy's name was, who was the, um, the main guy behind it. Eurogamer actually got a reply from him just saying he's not going to comment on it at this time. Well, That's from what we'll I've seen. we have to keep an eye on what goes on this. I've got a feeling this could be Coleco Part 2. Yeah, well, it's not looking good, I've got to say. And it's uh, Some people have received them, though, which is a weird bit. Okay. So it's not like it's, you know, vaporware. There are yeah. some of them out there as well, but... I think just not all of them at the moment, or maybe they've got a just one bloke who's sitting there packaging them. Well, from what I've read, really slowly. I mean, some people on the forums and uh, the Facebook groups have said um, that they used like a company to make the keyboards and stuff like that, and apparently this company ran into problems with getting parts and that kind of stuff. Ah, okay. um, which you know, th- this kind of stuff happens when you're doing yeah, small it projects. Yeah, it's a li- supply problem. But be... let your backers know. Yeah, you let know your I mean? backers know. Keep them updated. They've they've given money. They want to know what they're going to get. And it's just, you know, obviously, it, I think in our community, we understand that these are small teams that are working on stuff. And people give you a lot of leeway if you're like, look, look guys, we're having problems with it. Give us like another three or four months. We'll, keep, mm. we'll update you again then. People are more than happy just to be like, oh, that's fine. You know, we understand. I think it's when you shut down, just don't say anything. That's when people start to feel a they bit annoyed. start to worry because then they start to second guess everything. Yeah, and it's like, and I think it puts people off other Kickstarters as well. And you know, Kickstarter is such such a big part of like the retro gaming scene these days. Yeah. So um, hopefully we'll get a good outcome on this. We'll uh, we'll keep you up to date if we hear any more, and we'll pop a link if you uh, are one of the people affected by that to that uh, Facebook group where you can chat to other people. Now I thought this was quite um, interesting on PC Mag's website. Have you seen these uh, pictures of abandoned arcades? Uh, no, I'm just about to have a look. Well, there's a, a guy who's an urban explorer. Ah, okay. So these are guys that break into empty buildings and take photos and stuff. Yeah, well, there's this uh, community of them. And they've actually got into like um, places that ho- housed old arcades. And there's <laughs> some, quite frankly, heartbreaking pictures here of like old 80s and 90s arcade machines that have kind of decomposed and fallen over the side and the glass screens have all smashed oh, out I of just them. want to go in there and do them up. <laughs> well, it's just like, oh my God, they've got an old uh, centipede machine here and they've got like all the old Atari ones. Oh, this, this is so tragic. It's then. insane, isn't it? And looking at it, I mean, yeah, there is old Atari games here. There's like a, an original uh, 1980s Outrun um, machine here as well. It's, you know, the, the monitors all collapsed in and stuff like that. But it's crazy that, you know, these machines are actually worth a fair bit. And there's kind of pictures from abandoned arcades all around the world. One not too far from here, there's a place called Low Hall Mill in Leeds. And there is an old um, a cocktail table of a game called Moon Alien Unit that came out in 1980. And it was oh. kind of a competitor to a galaxy and like a Space Invaders kind of game. How big is your car, Dan? <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> how, how come people haven't nicked that in like 30 yeah. years? Because yeah. these are actually, you know, they go for a fair bit. Yeah, yeah, you could probably make money back on petrol. We're not suggesting anything, guys. <laughs> and I know if anyone is an urban explorer, I've got mates that do this, and they, you know, I think they kind of have an unwritten code that you won't tamper with stuff that you find. Okay, so you leave it in its in its death place or its natural. But um, you know, looking at some of these here, there is a really nice picture in the end of this gallery, actually, of um, one of the arcade machines, and the sun's kind of shining on it, and it makes it look like the uh, the artwork's all illuminated and stuff oh, as nice. well. So it's. Yeah. But it's crazy just to see that obviously these companies have long gone and these buildings have all decomposed. And probably, the, you know, they considered these things too heavy to move and probably they thought, oh, no one's going to be bothered about that in like 20, 30 years. Yeah, no, now they're relics of the past. Yeah, so, uh, and they're just there, you know, rotting away in these dusty old warehouses and things. Well, another thing that you can do uh, to kick your machine into life is not arcade classics, but you can get all your old Game Boy classics. And this is coming with the summer update of the Xbox. And it's basically every single Game Boy game, Game Boy Advance game, and Game Boy Color game for free on the Xbox without paying a single penny. Now, this is because um, they're opening up the Windows 10 store on the Xbox One. Yeah. I mean, I, I've kind of read a bit about this. I mean, is it going to be the full Xbox One store, or is it just going to be kind of... Because, ch- I mean, there's stuff on there, people are saying, obviously, this is an emulator that's available mm. for Windows at the moment, that they're saying, you know, you'll be able to install that on your Xbox One. And well, they were saying you can also get the 360 titles and the Xbox Classic ones all for free as well, so... Well, there is a guy in Reddit who's already doing this with the um, the Game Boy game, so it's working at the moment, apparently, on the, you know, the beta kind of dashboard. Yeah. Yeah, but there are also stuff on there like uh, you know, like torrent clients and that kind of thing as well, and uh, maybe stuff like UAE and oh, you know, if Vice it's the and... Windows Ten store, then yeah, there's a massive uTorrent client on there. There's loads because mm-hmm. I, I use that on Windows Ten. So, and uh, I guess what they're trying to do is 
they're trying to get popular like the PlayStation Network store because they're probably not that popular, to be honest. Well, so I've... they're... Giving away all of these games, and you know, to tempt people in. Well, I see it as more of like Microsoft trying to bring Windows and Xbox platforms together. I mean, you know, I'm. Well, I mean, you look at the Xbox One now; it's essentially just a PC in a little case, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I reckon you know, Xbox will just become a name for Windows games. Well, also that's what they're trying to do with this uh, force of Windows 10 and everything. Yeah, because it's easier for them to have everything. Well, just, one of the big announcements yeah. they made recently was that every time you buy an Xbox One game now, you'll get a free license for it on Windows. Ah, okay. Yeah, you see. So it's just platform wars now, isn't it? And <laughs> no longer hardware. Who'd have thought the PC gaming would have such a big comeback though? Do you remember like ten, fifteen years ago everyone thought he was dead? Totally like... <laughs> dead, totally dead. And then the indie scene. I was like, Steam, what are you guys doing? You know, piracy, it's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, How wrong I was. But I think Microsoft though, they're looking at that thinking, Oh, we should have been doing that, you know, yeah. Steam. So Yeah, yeah, totally. They're a bit late to the yeah. game now, maybe, but I uh, you know, again, I mean it's just another example of kinda opening up the Xbox to be more of a, a PC, if you like, isn't it? The fact that you can install emulators and all that kind of well, stuff. Well, it's it amazing now. because now these back catalogues of games become assets as well. You know, before it was like a crappy CD-ROM with all your Atari collections. Now it's like, right, we've got the full Game Boy collection and we're legal, you know, we're, we're not just ROM files and complex setup. It's nice when you get the proper artwork and all that on your screen, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, the nice, you so, know, kind of UI and that kind of thing. So good that they're actually packaging in it and realising the value in these old games. Absolutely. Now, uh, some more Nintendo news, actually. Um, I hadn't heard of this before, but apparently British Telecom, BT, uh, did a trial back in the mid-90s on the Super Nintendo <laughs> to make interactive TV. God, do you, I, I, there's been so many attempts at interactive TV. God, I remember this old controller when Freeview just started coming out. It was this massive fat one with loads of colours and you could sit and play Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and press like green at the same time. <laughs> what, while it was on TV? Yeah, oh, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> um, but this, I mean, it seems that everyone had kind of forgotten about this because this cartridge here... It's just been rediscovered, and everyone's kind of like, whoa, we didn't know about that. <laughs> and essentially what it was, in 1996, BT trialled this interactive TV service to uh, 2,500 homes in two British towns, apparently. And the way it worked is, you put this cartridge in the top of your Super Nintendo, there's a little port on the back of it, and then it'd uh, connect up to a Voyager 2000 set-top box, and it provided a load of kind of services, stuff like um, video games, quizzes, and apparently it even had video-on-demand content as well. So that's crazy. On, all, on a Super Nintendo. Through, through the SNES. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I don't know how you did like uh, I can't imagine the quality would have been amazing on that. But maybe the set top box was doing it and the SNES was just being used as like an interface. Yeah, I mean I suppose Might that have been doing the hard work. That well yeah, they're kind of looking at how how exactly how that worked and stuff like that. Um and they reckon the idea was scrapped because obviously BT did like open TV after that, didn't they? Yeah. But it's quite an interesting discovery though, and you know, they're kind of looking uh, into you know whether the, you know they're going to dump this ROM and maybe look at the software on it and see how it all worked again. But it's uh... well, I love all the kind of pioneering phone technology and stuff like uh, what is it, CFAX as well, and all of that old stuff. It's great. I used to be a bit of a uh, bit of a phone nerd back when I was a kid. I remember going into. I think it was a BT shop we used to go into like on a Saturday. And I remember there was like a, an Amstrad video phone, probably the first ever one. Yeah. And they had a demo of it. And like my mate got to the other side of the shop. <laughs> and like, you know, we, you just kind of pick it up and you'd ring like the, it'd say, ring this number to try it out. Then you'd see your mate on the other side. It was like, you know, really low resolution about yeah. like 16 colors and you're all blocky and stuff like that. But I was like, wow, that's amazing. I used to do very naughty things like uh, open those boxes on the road with all the phone switches in. And stick stuff with <laughs> crocodile clips in there. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I, I won't calls. really go into it. But yeah, uh, monitoring phone calls as well. Oh, can you good. listen to yeah, it? Yeah. I remember because I had a neighbour actually who had a, an early, you know, analog cordless phone. And yeah. if I tune like an FM radio to the top of the dial, you could hear a phone call. Oh, no, that dude, kind of thing. seriously, we used to have this old black and white TV, and if you connected the aerial with a cordless phone, you could scan on the TV and pick up all the conversations in the local area. It was great, yeah. We just listened about weird stuff. <laughs> and digital ruined it all. Yeah, digital ruined it all, all this encryption. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's quite cool. I mean, you know, I just love the fact it's kind of like a digital archaeology, isn't it? You know, discovering all these kind of relics from the past and things that people forgot, which I think is quite yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, and all these 
like how easy it was, <laughs> you know, just to play around with big systems. You know. Right. Well, listen, guys, thank you so much for checking out the Retro Hour this week, episode number 28. Uh, everything we've talked about will pop in our show notes, as always, at theretrohour.com. Uh, do subscribe on iTunes if you listen there and leave us a comment. We should maybe do something in the future. Like, I know we've got a few uh, companies talking to us about maybe giving prizes and that kind of thing. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, and uh, maybe we'll be releasing some exclusive photos of stuff and stuff. So. Yeah, we've got some nice ones today, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> the cover of today's show, you may notice a rather nice girl in that. That is Katie Price, Jordan, sitting on John Kershaw's nap. For the next half an hour, then, we're going to get the story of uh, his involvement from the early days of video games through the bitmaps, Bullfrog, Graph Gold, all of that. So stay tuned. John Kershaw on the way for the next half an hour. And we'll catch you next Friday. See you next Friday. Welcome to the Retro Hour, John Kershaw. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Fine, thank you very much. After getting over a cold. Well, uh, obviously you've got a very rich history in gaming. and we thought you'd have some uh, very interesting stories to tell us about on the show. Um, so we start right at the beginning though, John. What was your first experience with a computer? What got you into it all? Uh, well, it goes back, actually, when I had a grandstand, if you ever remember them. Yes, I it do. It was an old black and white, and it was ping pong, all that sort of stuff. And then uh, it went up in the world to an Atari which was fantastic. It was colour. It was still like a Mode 7 graphics, but it was great. And one of the best games on there was, uh, I think it was uh, Empire Strikes Back, I think, at the time, mm -hmm. which was terrible graphics. It really was. And then I was kind of at school, obviously doing uh, programming. I used to be a programmer as well before becoming an artist and uh, found art very easy. Took over from doing and doing art. Wanted to reproduce that kind of effect what you saw in games because everybody else was doing it, whether it was on Spectrum or BBC. Mm. Ended up with BBC Micro. Trying to do graphics on a BBC Micro was near on impossible. Couldn't work out how, any, how anybody ever did any graphics on a uh, BBC, even on a Spectrum, other than typing it in a little grid and typing it in by hand, which took forever, which was no good for an artist. Uh, and then basically from that, I went on to college to do product design. Uh, and we used things for CAD. So that was kind of the closest I ever got to do anything to 3D. Uh, came out of college doing uh, art and design uh, or industrial design. And uh, a mate of mine who was a programmer, and this is my first big leap into the Amiga. We, uh, he had an Amiga. He was a programmer. I was the artist. We both couldn't get jobs at the time. Um, so I was producing artwork for a game we were trying to do ourselves, and he was doing programming. And we'd share one Amiga round his house with his mum bringing cups of tea, cake and various other things up. Basically carried on from that in the games industry. So that's way back in 1988, 89 maybe. Wow. <laughs> so that's a long time ago. Yeah. So it's really the 16-bit era then that you really got into doing graphics like properly yeah. for games then. Yeah. What, what kind of stuff were you doing before the uh, before Graphcold then? Were you, um, was it like the demo scene or was it just things for personal use? Oh, it's just personal use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really... I mean, put it this way, I did graphic... Everything I did for graphics was... Uh, I mean, they looked really flash graphics. Uh, everything was realistic. It was marker pens to concept artwork to using 3D stuff, which is really basic 3D stuff then. But you could make stuff really look cool. And then you got hold of an Amiga and you had eight colours or 16 colours to do something in and you couldn't... It was very difficult to reproduce that effect. I mean, BBC stuff... Was, I think I did some Mode 7 graphics for a game that we did. Uh, I can't remember what it was, some basic thing I did. It must have been just after school. They were like Teletext style, weren't they, Mode 7? It was, yeah. Mode 7 was. You had Mode 0, which you could barely see on screen because it was so flickery and tiny. And Mode 7 was, yeah, it was just blocks. I think it was seven or eight colours you could have, I think, if I remember rightly. So um, I saw that you'd also done some backgrounds, like parallaxes for... Fire and Ice and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, Fire and Ice. That was the AGA version. Yeah. So would that all be in like D Paint and? That was D Paint uh, Four. Oh, nice. And that would have been probably that. Yeah, they've been on the twelve hundred. We would have drew them on the twelve hundreds. We upgraded from five hundreds to twelve uh, hundreds when they all came out, and uh, which was a nice dream because what you could do because PCs were starting to take off at that point. They were only like three eight sixes or four eight sixes, I think, at the time. And, uh, yeah, you had PC discs you could put into a, an Amiga 1200, which, of course, you couldn't do with a 500. So you formatted a disc to PC format, and you could transfer files between PC for any um, 
map editing we used to do on the PC. So if everything from things like Fire and Ice would have been map editing on a on a PC, uh, not on an Amiga. Uh, we've uh, crossed to DOS, is it? Yeah, seven seven twenty yeah, k yeah. discs, wasn't it? They were, yeah. The the, the little um, the little black discs, the first ones, yeah. Not the big five and a quarter inch ones, which I remember from school. <laughs> oh, the actual floppy ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember them from school. We used to use them as frisbees. <laughs> Mega twelve hundred was really good. Yeah, well, I was going to really, say then, because a lot of people at the time were like, um, you know, w- wondered whether the um, Amiga twelve hundred was enough of an upgrade over the five hundred. As someone who did graphics, I mean, did you find that there was quite a lot more capability there? It was faster. The upgrade in the software was uh, slightly better because you could do uh, there was a few other things you could do you couldn't normally do with the 500 version of course you had a different palette structure you could have so because you could do uh, all sorts of palette changes and uh, palette configurations and everything and have them all in there at once whereas before in the 500 you'd be loading it in and you'd have your 16 colors you couldn't have all the palette there in front of you and all sorts of stuff so yeah that was it was a lot easier to use a 1200 so um, were you using the Amigas to also develop on other systems? So kind of using it to develop the art and then sending it out to different systems? Oh, well, oh, actually, yes, you are right. They were uh, Mega Drive stuff. So we did it for uh, Mega Drive Master System. Uh, they'd even, obviously, uh, eight colours. I think it was Master System. Uh, what was that? 16 colours finally on screen. I think it was 48 for the Mega Drive. Mm-hmm. So you'd have... Uh, broken down your colors in that way uh cycling colors or color for a character colors for background and if you have a look on the on the, certainly on the website there's some of the old things like ottifants was one of the first projects i did at uh graph gold which was um, this crazy german product which i believe is still there now of a uh, elephant some national character this chap crazy guy had this uh, adventure of this elephant going on adventures and we had to do a game for it through sega and uh, we came up with this idea of platform game obviously and an elephant running around in his imaginary world so in his bedroom in a jungle in a garden and, and so on and uh, yeah it was pretty crazy pretty crazy so um it was uh, quite hyped as well wasn't it because they they said that they were going to do a tv show that would rival the simpsons and you know it yeah, was well, going to be this Germany, big Germany probably was big. I mean, I think it was pretty big. But over here, we we hadn't ne- we had never heard of it. And the the guy was mad. <laughs> he really was mad. Whether, whether he's still going or not, I don't know. But he was he was a cartoon artist as well. He he just sketched stuff down in front of you. But I think he wanted to translate that on screen, which of course the technology wasn't there then, so you couldn't really do it. And you couldn't do kind of the animations that he wanted either, because you know you're pretty much limited to what you could do so yeah so Amiga 1200 used to produce work on there whether it was for an Amiga game or whether it was going on Master System Mega Drive even Game Gear I think there was obviously an Amiga console as well did you do much on the CD32? Uh, well only no I think uh, I can't remember if Fire and Ice went onto that or not yeah it did yeah it did yeah so anything we'd done for the 1200 version would have gone on the AGA version which was that wasn't it so uh, yeah and I, don't, I think we only all we did is upgrade colours on everything yeah, so it was upgraded on colours, parallax layers. You could do a bit more colour and more fancy stuff with it. And when we did Virocop, I think we had to go through that and recolour everything so it was uh, an AGA version. So it had more colour, more shading, looked richer. Not forgetting that monitors at the time or TVs used to blur colours anyway, so that's how we used to use it. So if you if you get too, co- too many colours close together, it never really worked on the TV. If you separate them, you can get colours blending and stuff on the TV probably look pretty dire on the monitor now but uh you used to use the inefficiencies of a, an old tv to see what the, the actual graphics would look like because most people were using rf back colors. then weren't they yeah i mean i think i had uh, i think we used to have i used to do everything on a phillips it was a phillips kind of trinitron or sony's trinitron uh monitors we had for drawing stuff on but we used to have a monitor next to it so i could see what it was going to look like on a tv you know, and see see if it'd work. And see of course, your color range was different for a Mega Drive as well. So you know, you only had so many reds and greens and whichever. And as soon as that went went over to, if you'd be fine doing it on a on a Mega Twelve Hundred, but your palette range was massive. But of course, a Mega Drive wasn't. So you'd end up sometimes with a couple of blues or something that are the same. They don't look the same on the Mega because the the range 
for them, so you'd have to tweak them to get them to work on a Mega Drive. So you needed the TV next year in those days to see what it was going to look like. Well, he made an interesting point there about, um, you know, kind of using the inefficiencies of the television to kind of hide artifacts and stuff like that. There <laughs> yeah. is quite a... There's a debate these days in, like, retro gaming forums about whether you should use, like, an old-school CRT to play these classic games. I mean, do you think they were more designed with that in mind, weren't they? So you're probably going to see a different experience on a modern flat screen. Yeah, you are. Um, I mean, in fact, the resolution's so low. But, uh, yeah, you, you, that's how we used to use the TV. Um, seeing it now, it's a shame if some you can't... If you play an old retro game now, it doesn't look quite the same, I don't think, on a decent monitor. Too you don't, sharp. You don't, yeah, it's too sharp. Yeah, it looks pixely, it looks great, and it looks retro, but, you know, you use the TV to blend those colours together. It's like a, an old master's old painting. If you stand close to a painting in a, in a gallery... You know, it looks pretty flawed when you see it close together. But when you start stepping back, it all merges into one and looks, it works together. Now, pixel art was like that. You used to be able to do that. It's take step back so the monitor, and a really rubbishy TV it used to do that for you. So, um, you came quite late into the Amiga's life in the industry. Um, what was the kind of feeling at the time around then? Well, I mean, I was in, I was there what ninety one with Amiga, nine nineteen ninety with Amiga. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it was fine while we were at, um, I was at Graph Gold, the time I was at Graph Gold, we were looking leading towards um, PlayStation at that point, because we had development kits, the blue development kits we had for PSX, as it was known at the time, and we were slowly moving over towards that, and, you know, all of us had the feeling, was it going to take off, because the biggest game machine was an Amiga, and would would the Sony take off? And yeah, I saw some stuff on the Sony and you look in and you go, wow, this is really cool. You know, whether it was as big as Leap from the Amiga at the time when the first products come out, I'm not entirely sure. I think the Amiga still had it. It was only when you had things like perhaps Tomb Raider turned up, went, oh, and then there's this nice lady running around in skimpy pants <laughs> and, and, and solving puzzles. And I think Sony just got it right with products. You know, with the actual right title, you know, and Amiga and, and Amiga and developers just went went that way. They went, oh, hang on a minute, we want to do that. We've got to come up with something which is as cool as that. Otherwise, we're not going to sell our stuff. We're not going to sell our products. Well, before you moved away from the Amiga, I mean, one of the um, products that you worked on in, I think it was 95, so it was quite late in the Amiga's life, was uh, Virocop. That came out. Yeah, um, yeah. Now, the original yeah. name was Virus Alert. Is that right? Why was that changed? It was originally going to be called Dave, actually. Oh, really? Which is what the character is called, Dave. Mm-hmm. Right, which was digital armored virus exterminator or something that come up with. <laughs> it's terrible now when you think about it, but uh, I think it was the same time that uh, I think we were publishing through Warner, and at the time I think they were releasing the film called Dave, which was the American president film, I think. So for some reason they didn't want to call it that, mm-hmm. so we had to come up and change the name. And I, I can't remember if it was the, us that came up with that new name or it was them. And that's the only reason the name changed. And that did come out, you know, like I said, 95. That was kind of a year after Commodore went under. I mean, were, were sales yeah. a bit disappointing then? What was kind of the feeling? No, sales, I remember it doing really well because at the time, Mike uh, Montgomery, the Bitmap Brothers, they had Chaos Engine 2 going at the same time. And I remember being at ECTS and we had them both on the same stand. And we did rather well out of it. And if I remember, sales did really well out of it as well marketing everything i didn't think we did i think we did a lot on scores if i remember rightly as well for reviews perhaps it was just a different product but i think i mean we'd been fine if we had been a couple of years before or a year before we'd probably done even better but mm-hmm. the fact that yeah it was towards the end of it we probably pushed what you could do with amiga and that type of game looked great played well and you know you can still look at lots of sites all over youtube and everything else where people releasing videos of the game still that they play it you know and talk about the game so it must have had some impact on some people absolutely well you mentioned the uh, the playstation when you first saw that i mean it's crazy to think now that people were actually quite skeptical about sony who at the time was seen yeah. as like a tv company coming into the gaming industry um yeah. tell, tell us about these early like playstation development kits you saw then what were they like uh we had well i remember seeing actually i went along to a sony um presentation of the playstation one and it was a launch and their PlayStation PSX must have been the size of a fridge. It was <laughs> massive. It was just boards. There was nothing there. I don't even think there was a real controller. And they were showing all these flashy screen things on screen. And there was some sort of 3D demo that they had. Yeah, it was all singing, all dancing. But there was nothing there. You really didn't see anything. 
you had no idea what this thing was even going to look like. Not until, must be, I don't know, a few months later, we ended up with one of these blue PlayStations turn up. All under security, you had to sign all sorts of NDAs and things with Sony, which of course Steve Turner did. And you had to sign your life away. This this kit couldn't leave the building, all sorts of clauses that they had. And, uh, yeah, I think the first demo we had on there was Ridge Racer, actually, I think, which is pretty cool. Well, from someone who did graphics, I mean, was that kind of a massive, like, leap forward, the fact that, you know, it kind of everything moved from 2D to 3D when the PlayStation yeah. came out? Did you find that changed the way you worked a lot? Yeah, because everybody, certainly the artists, we all start to use um, 3D Studio. Even if we were doing sprites, we were modeling and everything in 3D. So the move from sitting there pixelating drawing everything by hand which took forever i don't even i can't, still can't believe i used to do that and take hours doing all that to knocking something out in the 3d model and then just rotate it the eight spins or 16 spins or animate some legs or arms or whichever you needed to do and you could just knock this stuff out in half the time or even less for what you were trying to do for a game we used to even render off backgrounds and stuff as well and yeah you might have less colors or anything else you needed but you'd you'd still clean it up, whether that's going on a texture or whether that's going on a, even in an, an Amiga game. We were still doing some stuff. I mean, the, one of those screens I did for uh, Parallax Layer for Fire and Ice, the, the ship the, with the big ship, I mean, I just drew that. And we, you know, that was when I think scanners first come in. We had this really expensive scanner. So I just drew it, scanned it in, and then just cleaned it up in uh, Dean Paint 4. It's a great chip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've still got the original artwork somewhere. Nice. It'll be worth a bit now. Oh, it's not worth, uh, probably worth, not worth anything, is it? <laughs> you might be surprised. <laughs> yeah, fire and ice CD32 <laughs> copies are very expensive. Um, are they? Yeah, yeah. So, um, Bitmap Brothers, the one of the last projects you worked on was Z with them. Yeah, now, Z, Z Steel Soldiers, yeah. Yeah, and that was attended for the Amiga originally and then uh, kind of went into the PC. Right, it, yeah, well, you've, you're, you're, you've got Z, which was the original, right? Yep. So z, z, there was Z, which, uh, yeah, could have well been intended for the uh, Amiga, but the only things I did with Z, because I was at Graph Gold at the time, and I knew Mike, they had me doing a load of uh, storyboarding and designs for the ships and stuff, and they, some of the vehicles and various other bits and pieces they had in the game for that. So the physical pixel art i didn't do any of that for zed but the kind of the crossover as we were moving over into all the 3d stuff and the concept stuff yeah i went down that road with zed and of course many years later then we had zed steel soldiers turn up which was a 3d game which was very far removed and different than the original zed was uh were you responsible for the image of the robot um kind of general with the big cigar which one? <laughs> <laughs> I think there were many generals. So the, the newer one, yes. The older one, no. Okay. The older one was done by uh, Terry Cottrell, uh, who used to work with me at Graph Gold, and then Mike poached him. And he went to, because uh, in those days, everybody knew everybody. So you can move around in the industry really easily. Yeah. And yeah, Mike poached Terry, who was really good on uh, doing 3D stuff and did all the FMV stuff for um, for um, Z uh, with Brad and Alan in it and Zod. I think we would have one of we must have been one of the first, certainly in without the group because there was ourselves, Graph Gold, there was Sensible, obviously Bitmaps, and I can't think who the other one was that were in the, all the whole group together because it's part of Renegade. Um, mm, yeah. And we must have been one of the first that had 3D packages to to knock to do this some of this stuff. And there's, so there was this transition of, again, pixel art to kind of 3D stuff. And this is when all the, the big 3D stuff and everybody went, we want to spend loads of money on FMV. Yeah. And everybody <laughs> got into spending lots of money on FMV. Now, I'm sure you probably got, Michael probably told you how long that took to do that intro, all those intro stuff for Z. It went on for years. I bet he hasn't told you the proper, the, the full amount of time, did he? And the cost. No. <laughs> <laughs> Put it this way, it went on for years. Well, uh, another amazing kind of FMV and really good title that I think should have been on the Amiga was Syndicate Wars. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. And uh, I'd, I heard that it had started because Michael Mann had done a small 3D demo and was just showing people in his office and they were like, what's that? He's like, oh, the new Syndicate game. Did you see that demo at all? Or no, I started just as EA took them over. So it probably was there in the office. I joined, there must, couldn't have been more than about 30 people there when I joined Bullfrog. They were just doing this big massive recruitment drive because EA had took them over. So it suddenly expanded very quickly. 
and there was loads of projects on the go. Uh, Gene Wars, um, yeah, the start of Syndicate Wars that was getting played with, and uh, Creation and Dungeon Keeper was on the go. And uh, yeah, I got involved in Creation, which was the Magic Carpet Engine. Oh, Have you ever nice. heard the story of Creation? Uh, no, no. This was this with Peter Molyneux. No, no, Peter was doing Dungeon Keeper. Yeah, so the head artist on actually um, running the project creation was uh, certainly the head artist was Paul McLaughlin, uh, who's was Lionhead Studios and wherever he is now, Two Cans is it maybe? I can't remember now. Yeah. But uh, yeah, basically, what it was using the Magic Carpet Engine, and what it was was uh, there was a distant world. And it was a kind of an eco game where you flew from Earth, you got to this planet, and you had to go and rescue life on the planet and rebuild the life on the planet in a submarine, defending underwater creatures and building cities and so on. It's very similar to Magic Carpet, but set underwater. But EA ended up canning it after spending a fortune, and lots of us doing lots of flashy FMVs and 3D modeling, and it got canned. So I'm sure you could probably dig something out on the internet about creation. And find out what happened to it. Is there any beaters or anything lying around? Is there any artwork left? Oh, I don't know. No, no. I mean, I've got bits of artwork that I still had. I did for it. Three uh, D stuff. It was just stills um, floating around. I'm sure if I can dig it out, I can give it to you. No, oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good to put on the Facebook or something. Well, cause Magic yeah. Carpet Engine, actually. I mean, I remember when that game was first demoed. I think I saw it on uh, yeah. on Bad Influence on TV, and I'd never really seen any, anything like that. It was kind of the first kind of three D free roaming flying game that you could explore anywhere really i mean was was that quite yeah, a was, benchmark yeah yeah i remember i mean i remember was playing at graph gold so yeah many hours at graph gold playing that i mean once you start to see some really cool stuff you know on playstation then things did change i think and you start to see where it was going to go further down the line i mean we did syndicate wars playstation uh obviously what i was lead artist on for that and we had to, I had to try and do Saturn version at the same time. And the Saturn was a dog. You couldn't do anything with it. It was rubbish. You couldn't do the art on it. You had to cut everything down. Nothing ever worked. And in the end, EA took the decision to can the Saturn version because it was just such a nightmare to work with. Well, the um, intro on Syndicate Wars was amazing as well. I think it, it kind of completely showed the great picture of that uh, Syndicate story, you know the real world melting away really good yeah so the original was chris hill for that who's now sadly passed last year or year before yeah chris hill really good technical artist absolutely outstanding when it comes to that sort of stuff yeah and what we decided to do for the playstation version was a cut down version of that they just come back and said we need something for about 30 or 40 seconds so we uh, completely used some of the assets that we had from the pc version intro and did something a little bit different for the PlayStation version intro and just make it a bit more punchier just because the market was different on, on the PlayStation than it would be on the PC. So I'd say there's another title as well in that time period, Theme Hospital, yep. which kind ah, of yeah, yeah. stuck with the 2D stuff but um, managed to yeah. be massively successful as well. Yeah, I got roped into doing bits and pieces on that. <laughs> I had, one of the things I had to do for that, I had to do, a, uh, and I've probably still got the artwork somewhere, each of the guys on the team, including myself, we had to do, um, for marketing, we had to do, because there was things like bloatyitis and hairyitis and all that, that <laughs> people could catch in the game. So the team, we had to doctor the team for real, yeah, in photographs. And, of course, now it's easy to do, isn't it? But back then, that was Photoshop in its infancy and so on, you know. just th I think Photoshop, we were still we were still using Windows probably 3.1.1 then. Mm -hmm. It was a real first basic of Photoshop or Adobe at that time. And you still were booting up in DOS or Windows. So it was really early days then. Yeah, so we did various other stuff for Theme Hospital. That was pretty good. There was also Theme Prison was considered at one point. Oh, that would have and, been amazing. That's the escapist yeah, now, isn't was, it? Uh, there, was a, there was a story about this, of, of, you know, from what I remember of this, but you'd have to check. <laughs> There's because Gary Carr was the original uh, head art lead artist on uh, Theme Park, and uh, not Theme Park. Um, sorry, Theme Hospital. And uh, yeah, there was some nutter rung up saying you've nicked my game design. All right, and it turned out that reception had let let this guy through onto the phone to to Gary's phone, and this guy was a prisoner, and he reckon he he reckon he invented the game. So whether this is true that EA decided not to carry on with it because of that reason it could well have been or there might have been some other reason but it didn't 
theme prison didn't happen. <laughs> Another theme game is a theme park world as well that you. Yeah, theme park. Yeah, originally it was theme park when I was doing it, uh, and then I think after I left they changed the name. So I left about I don't know towards the end of it, and uh, yeah, so various other projects. I worked on there that I got canned. There was a pyromaniac thing we were trying to do in between Syndicate Wars when I finished that to start on Theme Park. And yeah, we did a lot of work on Theme Park. Took it up to being 3D. There was still, actually, to be fair, I might have even still used Dean Paint for do some of the textures of what I remember. I can't remember now, but there was something, it was Deep Paint, or there was a PC version of Deep Paint that I had to do some stuff on until we crossed over and, and uh, got decent machines so we could do all this. This is when 3D really took off with Bullfrog. Uh, so the artists got decent machines so we could have 3D software. And I think this is when probably 3D Studio Max first turned up. must have been version 1 or something like that. Another project which was very different in terms of uh, the way EA strategy was for graphics. We did all this nice flashy graphics. Uh, based around normal theme parks, so you'd have everything from a uh, Western world to a horror world to you know whatever it was, trying to get it visually looking really nice. So n- nothing else was out there because I think the only similar thing was it. I think uh, Frontier did something similar, the kind of theme park thrill game. We had to send everything off to EA for being checked. This is the whole different with EA, which Bullfrog really didn't have this before, and we were in control of everything ourselves. Even though we were first were taken over by EA, it was still within the management structure of passing things, mm-hmm. saying, yes, that's signed off and so on. But as EA took more and more control, everything had to go off to different territories. So we spent best part of, I don't know, maybe four or five months doing loads of artwork for a Western world, which looked really good. We had uh, a couple of guys doing all these little sprites of little guys running around and, and uh cowboy outfits and Indian outfits and of course they, you could cha- change your characters to go in different rooms and put different costumes on and all this sort of stuff. We made it look really good, little western towns and roller coaster, rickety rides, all this sort of stuff. It goes off to the EA, EA territories and EA USA basically said no, they can't have it because it was all to do with um, cowboys the, and the Indians. Nat- yeah, the Native <laughs> American thing because you had little guys dressed up as Indians. So they said no because we could get sued <laughs> or there's a potential risk. So they, I mean, talk about yeah. So we, we we canned months of work, which of course a lot of us weren't happy with, including myself. The amount of artwork they just got wasted, but did look really cool at the time. So yeah, theme park pretty good, but towards the end of it, I obviously left, and because uh, Mike Mike uh, from Bitmaps poached me. Well, uh, another game you mentioned was Dungeon Keeper, and I guess with uh, Peter Molyneux on it, there wasn't that much interference. Well, there was. <laughs> it, was well, it, it was just so... successful, massively. <laughs> well, I'm going to drop myself in it now, aren't I? Right? So, okay, so I, because the project was late, I was doing creation, and this is a crossover between creation and Syndicate Wars all going on at the same time, and I, I was moving around from project to project until I ended up with a lead on Syndicate Wars and so on or whatever. But what happened was there was um, a big problem of them not finishing and the game being late. So basically the AA um, gods or head office or guys at the top said, right, they've got to be in the office because he was working from home with their team and basically not getting anything done. So they ended up in the office and what they also did is they wanted more artists on the team to get it finished. So even like me, ended up having to do really some basic artwork for the game to get things finished, just uh, assets to go in the game, things like little uh, candle holders and candles and various other silly things that had to go in the game, just so they could try and get this finished. But they would not let him work at home, and they wanted him in that office and report in every two weeks of the progress of that game. We all had to report every so often where we were with the game. You had to do a presentation within the company, show them where you were and what was happening, but they kept a big eye on Peter Molyneux and his team to make sure that game got finished because it was many years late as you probably know that wasn't uncommon with a lot of peter's games though was it really i suppose <laughs> no no I, I i tell you what i remember being in the second office uh, uh well it's probably the third office isn't it but in uh so in the business center uh which is next to a3 and i'll be working late doing syndicate wars doing some sort of pallet change stuff 
And that's why I actually used Omega 1200 because I was doing all these palette changes. So I could have different palettes on the PlayStation that we could load in different palettes using the same graphics. So I remapped all the textures so you could change. So you could have rusty colors and all sorts of other stuff changing from level to level. The less amount of graphics you could have on the PlayStation compared to a PC. But he had to be in the office as well, and they were really late. And how I remember it really well, the is it Hale Bop? The, one of the meteors was up in the sky at the time. Oh, I was yeah. there for months. And he was there in the office for months because of that. And I always remember that, him being there. And, you know, we were pretty chatty. They'd come over. Uh, and that uh, You'd help out. That's what used to happen in the company. You'd help each other out if you need to on any of the stuff. They were stuck. Uh, if you're working late, there was this regime where, you you know, they would buy you curries or pizzas or whatever it is. And you used to have all that. And, you know, it was pretty good, pretty good, really. I mean, the office was like people having sleeping bags under their desks all the time. And I was one of them. So yeah, he was made to. They were their team was made to stay in the office for Dungeon Keeper. I'm probably going to get shot for that now, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, what was that? What was Peter like as a guy then? I mean, did did he work closely with him? What was he? What was he like? To uh, not close. Not clo- I didn't really work with him on the team, but uh, you know, there's other guys that worked with him. Some people liked him. Some people didn't like him. Uh, I can't can't say one way or the other. I never had a problem with him really, but. It was all. For, it was always very good. If um, you know, you want, you had a question. He was very good at answering questions, as you probably gather when he interviews. Yeah, it was a lot. I was found helpful. I didn't really, I didn't really have a problem with him. Some did, but maybe they were guys that had been around a lot longer than me at Bullfrog. So, well, uh, Bullfrog was a great company. Like when I was a kid, nearly every game that came from Bullfrog was decent. It must have been um, quite mad, kind of seeing it end. Yeah, well, it didn't really end, though, did it? Because what happened? It got absorbed. It got absorbed, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Because we, I was there when Westwood got taken over as well. So we all got taken to Woking Odeon, I think it was, or something like that, one of the big cinemas. And there was this big, it was all this hush-hush, you're all going to get ferried down there. So we all got down there. And at this point, EA was about 250 of us. So, it, it, uh, sorry, Bullfrog got to about 250 of us, maybe more. And we'd outgrown the studio that we are in. And um, we all got taken to the cinema. They just hired the cinema and they did this big announcement. Les Edgar and whoever exec were there did this spin out. We bought Westwood, you know, and then Westwood just disappeared as well after that. They all vanished. It was uh, it was Origin as well. I think they bought Origin, didn't they? All the Wing Commander stuff. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that just disappeared as well. The only thing I remember from that is I used, they had some code for turning FMV. They had a really good... Um, way of getting FMV working on a PlayStation. So the FMV I did for the PlayStation for Syndicate Wars, I used that engine to do that and uh, compress it. It was really good. So that's about as much as they paid for, probably, for all that technology. And then it just vanished, didn't it? Nothing, hap- nothing happened with it. I mean, you mentioned FMV there, actually, because, I mean, that was quite an interesting era in gaming. So, I mean, I think it all started with um, that Mad Dog McCree game. Do you remember that? The, the cowboy one? Um, yeah. in the arcades and then after that everything needed like an FMV intro for like about two or three years what did you think yep. of that era then did you like it or were you happy when it finished no because if you're an artist because I'm a kind of a bit of a general artist so I can do pretty much anything really whereas now you kind of blinkered you're either a character artist an FMV artist a character artist a texture artist or lighting or whatever it is now if you go back to when I started you got to do everything which was great and certainly when it came to FMV that was that was artists loved doing that that was their thing that's what they wanted to do everybody wanted to create models and render them off and do all that cool stuff so yeah it was really good for people like me that's what you wanted to do we were always messing about in the office doing things like that small snippets and bits and pieces uh but any any game any chance we'd get to do anything now it's obviously on a massive scale and you just couldn't do it yourself now you just couldn't do it. You need massive teams. I remember some studios tried to do it with like uh, just camcorders and stuff like that. You look back on them, they haven't <laughs> aged very well. <laughs> no, no. Well, in fact, my FMV from uh, Syndicate Wars PlayStation looks a bit ropey. <laughs> you look back and you think, oh, there's that mistake in there. Or there's a, you know, it looks really dodgy now. At the time, that was jaw dropping because you'd never seen anything like it. Yeah. You know, I'm probably like most, most artists, but I produce something. If I ever did work that could hang on a wall, I would never put it on the wall the next day because I'd put it up there and I'm going, oh, it's got to come down because I'd, I'd want to change it or I'm not happy with it or, you know, it, it, I can never, I always think uh, something doesn't look good enough. I'm probably the worst nightmare for managing my own art 
because I want to always change it if it isn't good enough. And I think any of them that look back at probably the work that they've done over the years, I think you'd, you would look at it and go, oh, I'd love to do that again. That's where the HD upgrades come in, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll get to your time at the Bitmap Brothers. I mean, um, obviously, yeah. you know, they were kind of like rock stars in the industry back then. What, what was it like to work work in that environment? See, when I, before I started out as Graph Gold and I was doing, trying to do my own games with my mate Ian Wallington, you know, we used to play Bitmap Brothers games. Yeah. And not in a month of Sundays did I ever think I was ever going to work for them, you know. And then there I am at Graph Gold. I get to meet Mike. Me and Mike are very good mates. Uh, and we shared a common interest of sailing. So we'd... we'd you know, we used to go sailing a lot. And for years, Mike was trying to get me to join Bitmap Brothers. Uh, and eventually, I succumbed to it and ended up in, in the Bitmap Brothers. And, yeah, it was a pretty cool thing to do. There was that whole, I'm part of the Bitmap Brothers now. Uh, very different than being at Bullfrog. Mm-hmm. There was the whole corporate thing wasn't there. It still had a little bit of that whole, yeah, probably that little rock star feel to it. That really kind of like pop era, isn't it? Well, they're very strong in image, weren't they? You'd all see them in the yeah. uh, magazines with the shades on. You know, there's obviously the infamous helicopter picture. Yeah, we still had those photographs taken when I was there. <laughs> there's a few. Fl- there are a few floating around. Yeah, when I had her. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously around that time, they kind of made a big deal about the uh, bitmap versus sensible kind of, you know, little like friendly war they had going on. Um, what did you think of that yeah. at the time? Mm, no, I didn't really get involved in that, to be fair. Uh, or no jobs and obviously no mic so to be fair I didn't really get involved in any of that <laughs> it was just, I mean I was probably I was craft I was probably still at Graph Gold then mm-hmm. when that was going on between them two so we were kind of the underdogs anyway just looking at those guys up there thinking we'd, we want to be part of that and obviously in the end I was but uh, I mean they're the best of mates those two so it's like you know we're always out having a drink or whatever so it's just the way it was isn't it yeah, I kind of got the impression that they were very like like you said the rock star kind of thing it was um, image was quite important it was, it yeah, was good it, fuel for the magazines as well. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, they loved it. I mean, come on, after the titles that they had with the soundtracks on them, that was all part of it. And then you get Jobs trying to do it in, um, you know, with the war and everything on cannon fodder and stuff. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of, it was back and forth all the time, wasn't it? I was trying to outdo each other that one, Steph. <laughs> yeah, they were. Yeah. And then, you know, that was good. I think that's good. I think that, one is refreshing, but I think that kind of rivalry is good. Yeah, competition you know. creates uh, creativity. Absolutely. Creativity, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that that is a good thing. As I, say, I didn't get involved in that side of it, but you know, for I would say that's a good thing for to have that. You know, it's the yin and yang, isn't it? <laughs> you know, but the yin and yang kept swapping around all the time. Well, obviously, I mean, we, we've covered a lot of history here. Um, and yeah. There might be people listening to this who are interested in getting into maybe, you know, doing game graphics. Is there any advice that you give people who are thinking to get into it these days? I, I This will be controversial. Don't go and do a computer games course at a university. <laughs> I, it's got its place. You know, even from when I was... Uh, we would be hiring, say, when I was at Bitmap Brothers, and we'd get artists come in that have got MAs and this, and they've got all this sort of stuff, and they just think that they they should have a job because they've got an MA or a degree, mm-hmm. and they think they've they've automatically got a place when they walk through into the games industry. I ended up hiring guys that had no qualifications, but they were bloody good artists, and you know you could work with them. And for me, that has far more um, uh, respect than just getting a nameplate saying I've got a degree. You can't kind of sit down and just be like, oh, I'm going to be creative now. <laughs> you, know, you need to live you can't, it. You can't. <laughs> or, you know, we've had artists in the past and uh, at EA and uh, um, even Bitmaps, and they go, right, here's my finished bit of work. It's on the schedule. It says, oh, X, Y, Z's finished. That's my part. I'm moving on to this now. You go, yeah, it's great, but can you do a bit more to it? Oh, no, 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 I've finished. This is what it is. You go, well, it's not quite right, is it? <laughs> you know, it needs a bit more work. It's not really the direction we're going in. You know, it needs this, this, this. Oh, I didn't think about that. And, you know, this is where you need them with a little bit of extra sparkle as well. The guys that are there at four o'clock in the morning in the paint package, they're the ones that do it right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not saying it's a good thing doing that, but, you know, I think you're either born with a bit of talent. You know, you, you can learn things. You're either born with it or you're not I don't think mm-hmm. you know you, you need to be able to have it in your blood to be able to do it what about you John what are you up to these days then oh, I'm still doing graphics for um, various uh, mobile games and and I do a lot of commercial artwork outside of games which I can't talk about but because it they're not a games firm they actually wanted to look like game art 
<laughs> so, which is really odd. And the only reason they want the artwork, so it looks like it's a game, but it's nothing to do with games at all. We've been chatting about this in our show recently, that kind of like those old school kind of, a lot of pixel art and stuff seems to have come back and be really cool again these yep. days. Yeah, it is, but so time consuming. When I sat there for hours, used to do pixel art. I thought nothing of it when I was younger. I do it now. I'm thinking, God, this takes forever. <laughs> it really does. Well, John, it's been yeah. amazing having you on the show this week. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. You're welcome. I hope it's been of some use. <laughs> it's been really interesting. If people want to find out a bit more about what you're up to, is there a website or a Facebook or anything? Yeah, you, you can do um, www.johnkershaw.com. Um, that will have... Uh, old stuff on there and every so often I'll be posting new stuff up on there so yeah so yeah there's a bit of everything on there <laughs> in fact I mean that's a small amount of stuff as well there's you know I've got so much stuff I just you don't get time to put it up mm-hmm. or some stuff I can't put up either so plenty of other there's a lot, very large portfolio absolutely well John thank you so much for coming on okay yeah thanks guys <laughs>